I would like to call the policy, resolution, and legislative committee of the Board of Education of the Wausau School District to order. During this meeting, board members will, in many cases, be hearing information presented to them for the first time. Their responses will, in many cases, be extemporaneous and should not be considered either their final uh, opinion on a matter, nor should any opinion expressed by an individual board member during any meeting be considered the opinion of the board as a whole unless it is presented as the, by the presiding officer as such. The next item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes. I seek a motion to approve the January 14, 2019 PRL minutes. So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Um, abstentions? I'm, I'm going to abstain. I wasn't here. Okay. Thank you. All right. The motion carries. Um, number three on our agenda is the legislative update. Last month, I shared information on the recommendations of, of the Blue Ribbon Commission on School Funding. That information is still available at the WASB website if you haven't had a chance to read the specific recommendations yet. Today, I want to call your attention to the school funding reform plan proposed by Governor Tony Evers. Governor Evers plans to make this funding reform proposal, which he refers to as Fair Funding for Our Future, plan part of the 2019-2021 state budget bill that he will be introducing later this month. According to the DPI, and I don't pretend to understand all of these things, but lucky for us, we have Bob. <laughs> <laughs> According to the DPI, the fair funding proposal contains the following key provisions. Shifts the funding from the school levy tax credit the first dollar credit and the high poverty aid to the general equalization aid formula. So that's the first thing. Second, provides an additional $596 million in state general equalization aids over the 2019-2021 biennium. $190 million in the first year and $406 million in the second year. Uh, over the 2018-2019 base. Sets a minimum aid level of 3,000 per FTE for every student in every district. Weights economically disadvantaged students in all school districts by an additional 20% FTE within the general aid formula for per pupil property valuation purposes only includes a new 5.8 million hold harmless provision in the 2020-2021 budget to ensure that every school district receives the same amount of total state support under the fair funding plan as it would have otherwise received under current law. Increases the current secondary cost ceiling from 90% of the state average shared cost per student to 100% of the state average, and increases the current special adjustment aid provision from 85% to 90% of each district's prior year state general aid. In addition, Evers' proposal calls for increasing special education categorical aid by $606 million in the 2019-21 biennium. This increase is projected to boost the percentage of eligible prior year special ed costs reimbursed by this aid from about 24.5% currently, and I know we've talked about this before, to an estimated 30% for the 2019-2020 budget and an estimated 60% in 2020 21 Evers' fair funding proposal would increase funding for student mental health by nearly $64 million, a tenfold increase, and it further calls for fully funding full day 4K, creating the state's first funding stream for after school programs and achieving two thirds state funding <coughs> of public schools without raising property taxes. The entire 2019-2021 biennial budget request of the Department of Public Instruction, including the Fair Funding for Our Future <coughs> funding reform proposal, um, can be found on the WASB website as well as the DPI website and um, 
in the minutes from this meeting, there'll be a link that you can click on, and I can send this legislative report to all of you, too, if you want it. In addition, a district-by-district district printout detailing the fiscal impact on each school district of the fair funding proposal can also be found. Um, NWASB has that on their website. They used the 2018-2019 numbers to kind of compare districts, so it's not set in stone for what would happen next year or the year after, but you get a general idea. So I did look up ours, and um, we get a slight increase, I think about 7 7%. 7%. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's real money. <laughs> so um, I think it'll be interesting to see how far this goes and what the negotiations are, which parts of this plan kind of stick and people can agree to and which things might be revised. But I was especially pleased to hear about the increase in the special ed funding because I know we've talked mm -hmm. about that a lot, that it just isn't where it should be. and. Um, seeing that number of 60%, <laughs> it kind of feels like pie in the sky, like could yeah. we really get that? But um, we are providing the services, and it would be nice if the reimbursement matched up a little bit better. Uh, could I add a few things? Yes. Uh, I could say a little or a lot. There's a lot to be said here. There's, there's a lot mm -hmm. of stuff. And, uh, governor, either <clears throat> before he was governor, his fair funding proposal has been around for eight or nine years. He brings it on every year, most of it gets ignored. And when you're looking at some of these different uh, budget recommendations, <coughs> it's important to keep in mind a couple of things. Whenever you see general or equalization aid increasing, just be aware that you should also be lobbying for a corresponding revenue limit increase. Because if aid goes up and the revenue limit doesn't go up, that's tax relief. <coughs> We've seen that before. And certain things on that list are going to help us more than other districts, and some will help us less than other districts. At least from my organization's perspective, we've made a concerted effort to try to support the fair funding proposal and not elements of the proposal, because opponents of the fair funding proposal have tried to divide districts and get them to fight against each other to get perhaps none of it to happen. So in my organization, the business or, uh, manager's organization, we're trying to support the whole fair funding proposal instead of bits and pieces that serve us well. There are things that are going to serve us better than others. When you think about special ed costs in particular, we are a high special ed district. So if we can reposition funds at the state level and fund special ed more than something else, that reallocation of funds will help us. When we think of the 1.2 per student for free reduced rather than the 1.0, we have a high free reduced population. Right. Mm -hmm. So that reallocates some funds also at the state level to favor some of the schools that are higher in free reduced, which would be us. Uh, so certain things help us a little bit more than others. Probably the one in here that means the most is the one you mentioned, the categorical aid for reimbursable special ed expenses, for every 1% that goes up, it'll impact us about $135,000 per year. So if it goes from 24 to 27 and a half, right now in our budget projections, we have 24 and a half. We're talking about it going up to 27 and a half. The fair funding proposal talks about going up to 30%. And a year later, 60%. That 135,000 for every 1%, every one of those percents, now that's outside the revenue limit. The revenue limit doesn't have to come along with it to match. That is direct money, categorical aid. That's probably the one that means the most. Mm -hmm. uh, and then other ones to a different degree. Uh, obviously, aid is good. Don't get me wrong. But if the revenue d limit doesn't come along with, right. mm -hmm. it's tax relief, which is good. I'm not going to say tax relief is not bad. It's not good, because it's certainly good. But it's not more spendable money. So we'd have to bring that revenue limit along with. Uh, so those are that's a real brief summary from the business manager's perspective of what we think about these things. <clears throat> All good. Well, there aren't any that are bad. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Did, did he have in any of this, when I was reading through it, did Evers have any suggestions in terms of what's going to support this from a payment side or what things could get cut? I mean as far as the general budget? <laughs> yeah, like what what's going to go into as they look yeah. at the total for all the districts, it's a half a billion. So, yeah. 
I mean, something gives something. That's the other thing that makes me most nervous. Yeah. Something has to be displaced in order for this to happen. But I'm also encouraged by recent revenue uh, assumptions mm -hmm. and revenue projections that are coming in at the state level, mm -hmm. that revenue projections are a little bit higher. Are they high enough to uh, support the kind of increases he's talking about here? And are I mean, not all of it, but some of it. That's why I'm more encouraged by reallocation of existing revenue to maybe go more towards high special ed districts or high free reduced districts. Mm -hmm. Because that wouldn't necessarily mean uh, additional revenue. It would mean perhaps taking away from some districts and giving to others. But I've heard a lot of folks out of Madison saying if there are losers, if you need to take away from somebody to give to somebody else, the likelihood of it happening just went down. That's why the one hold harmless provision is in there. I think it's $6 million uh, hold harmless, which one is it? 5.9 million, I think the number was. Uh, I can't say exactly which one it is. Uh, yeah, number seven, including a new 5.8 million hold harmless provision. That would help out the districts that would lose, kind of keep them whole. Big picture, I think we're just trying to be more fair with the way we fund school districts so that every kid gets an equal chance at, you know, mm -hmm. the resources. And that's a step in the right direction. Oh. We've known that it's been unequal for quite some time when you fund through property taxes. Mm -hmm. Well, being a high special ed cost district doesn't necessarily mean we have a higher percentage of kids that are in need, does it? It, it might does. well it, it well might well have... mean that we're meeting those needs in a more developed, more profound way. Well, I'm measuring it as number of students that have been identified. So number of students right. we are high. But you can do a better job than other districts in identifying too, right? Because those, so those aren't apples to apples. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we know that when we put money into education, we need less money in our uh, prison system. Yeah. So when you see um, full funding <coughs> for all day for K. Um, that's kind of encouraging to me. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think that's a step in the right direction, too. Okay, um, number four, policy 5900, wellness and nutrition. And Karen Fox is here. I am here. All right. Okay. Well, you got thank it up there. Okay, driving, you just tell she, her where to go. All right, sounds great. <laughs> so thank you for asking me to be here tonight. Um, I want to provide a little background information as to why the wellness policy and why now. It's kind of out of the blue. So we underwent a pretty intensive administrative review process in our department in the month of November. And one of the action areas that came out was our district level wellness <coughs> policy and the need for it to meet some minimum requirements that. Um, of the USDA. So one of the things we had to do was to actually have a meeting of a wellness committee. So I called together, I kind of hand-picked committee members so we could take action on this policy. And I tried to include members um, as suggested by the USDA. So you can read about that in the minutes as well. So we had very simple goals that day. We were gonna obtain compliance by number one, everybody was at the meeting. Two, we needed to approve some absolute changes here for the nutrition services sections of this wellness policy. And a few of those things, we had to actually state in there that we would meet on a triennial basis to review and evaluate the policy. We had to include several specific goals um, that we could actually evaluate every three years. So under the nutrition sections, you will notice a few items were put in there. Um, one of them w was the length of the breakfast and lunch time. Another uh, area that we put in there, you can click on the next one, um, was actually, let's see here. Hmm. Uh, yeah, you got yeah okay, okay right there that's what the smart the smarter lunchroom self-assessment so we picked that we would have at least one technique throughout the school district I know for a fact that we have more than that in a few of the schools 
but when we looked overall throughout the district, we had to be sure we could state we had met that at least one in each of the schools. Thanks, Bob. The policy itself has it that up there as well. This is also in your board book, the mm -hmm. track changes policy. Mm -hmm. So you'll see in red some of the changes that Karen's referencing. Right. And also, um, perfect. That's perfect. Okay. Sounds, <laughs> sounds good. Um, so we also, um, let's see here. I'm going to go, yep. So this is the 20 minutes for lunch, the 15 minutes for breakfast. Karen, can I ask you a question about yes. that? Yes. Now, does that mean 20 minutes from when the students are lined up in the, in the cafeteria? Correct. Once they're in the line. Once they're in line. Okay. That's kind of the minimum requirements recommended by the SNA, the School Nutrition Association. And I believe that is what our district follows currently, so we wanted to be sure we stated that. Would it be great? And I think some schools, it actually is a little bit more than that. Um, we did do some time studies in the last few years as well, timing kids from the time they entered the gymnasium to go through the line. and. You know, there is a little bit of time spent in the line, mm -hmm. three to five minutes, depending where you are at in that line. And then the actual time you get to eat is usually about 10, 10 to 12. They chitter chatter a little bit, and right. then they're asked to get up and go. So right. No, I just want to clarify that that doesn't mean they actually get 20 minutes to eat. Right. Right. Which You're is unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <coughs> Um, the diverse group of stakeholders, we have to kind of list them by title. Uh, we have to note in there that, that the meetings will be held on a triennial basis. Also, the policy needed accountability. So I took that accountability upon myself and a little bit for the building administrators who I do work with. And, and there were some areas we needed to improve upon with our smart snacks uh, when they came through this year. So it was nice to find that the principals in the buildings were very easy to work with and to help promote what we're doing here in the district. So that was that was encouraging. You know, mm -mm, it's not really. And that's that's pretty much the the end of what we actually had to have. So tonight I'm just asking for approval of those um, additions and changes so that we can be in compliance. Um, I had sent uh, some changes as well. They're, they're mostly technical uh, because my view is if we're going to go through and make changes, we should look at the rest of the policy and if there are areas where it can be improved for precision, um, that would be ideal. So it doesn't get a <coughs> workbook in time, but it's the copy that Cassie left for everybody. So there's track changes that are humans and there's track changes that are my suggested changes. I did see yours too. It, it was just, you know, little things like missing hyphens, sure. um, using, I, I changed some of the, I, the IEs to EGs because we mean to say, for example, in those um, instances, not in essence. Um, it, that Really, that's, I, I saw an instance where there was a proper noun that wasn't properly capitalized. Um, so it was just those types of changes, nothing, nothing substantive by any means. Um, although I did have a question about that in under nutrition education and promotion it's kind of odd to list goal colon in a policy sure. maybe like supporting documentation but um, it, I don't know if there's a way to just take that out or something it's I it, think we could rework, rework that somehow to take the word goal out of there and mm -hmm. just include that and some of these changes obviously weren't part of the changes that you brought but I just was reading it through under physical activity, use of all caps. That's a little bit inappropriate. <laughs> so I eliminated that. But um, those were the changes I had. I do have a, a question though. Mm -hmm. When we talk about wellness and nutrition, and in that first paragraph, there's a reference to mental well being. Is there any need? Is there any policy that addresses mental health because it's not addressed here and then I went to look in our policies and I didn't really see within the 5,000s so it seems like if we're going to talk about wellness that will be a component 
I, not that I'm aware of. Um, I have to come back and check the policies. I don't know if, if you happen to know. Mm -hmm. Not at the top of my head. Mm -hmm. I scrolled mm -hmm. through and I didn't see anything, but it seems like when we're talking about wellness, mm -hmm. mental health is part of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It is coming, you know, that's a topic that's bubbling up through the strategic planning process. Mm -hmm. um, so we can certainly see where it comes out there, but if the board were interested in a in a policy about it, I'd have to check and see what what might be out there. Mm -hmm. If that if that would be an interest of the board. It's pretty important. <laughs> it's kind of bizarre if we don't have a policy because there's certainly references, but no, nothing subst nothing substantive. As we develop mental health policies and counseling and stuff in within the school district, do you see? something coming before the board to help address that as far as the implementation or policies surrounding you know I guess I'd have to see if uh, what the need is uh, again I've been really focused on the development of the plan sure. at this point um, so I really hadn't really thought ahead to uh, the strategies or the implementation process but that would be something we could consider yeah you, you, yeah, you all will need to figure out if you need a policy to right. say the kinds yeah. of things that you're already doing and want to increase to it, whether there's, there's a need or not. Yeah. Well, Trisha, I took a different approach when I read the first paragraph, mm -hmm. and the approach I took was looking at the mission statement that's on here. And it made me think about your campaign and your advocacy work with food pantries. Mm -hmm. And when I think about, you know, student learning and advancing student learning and think about their well-being, you know, I thought about the work that you've done and the work that others in our school district have done uh, at some of our, um, you know, fiscal schools and providing, um, you know, food you know, for kids to be able to, you know, take as they need um, and not go home hungry. And I kept thinking about this policy and I wonder if this is the, the right opportunity for, for us to address and think about those things. And as I look at Karen's um, PowerPoint slides here, it talks about your, your third bullet uh, on your goals for this meeting, uh, that you, your administrative meeting or mm -hmm. review. And it talks about future plans. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if this is a good opportunity for us to start thinking about some of the things that you've brought up in the past. And I don't know if, I don't think there's a policy uh, mm -hmm. in our handbook or out there that talks about potential opportunities uh, for us to have uh, a food pantry mm -hmm. available at our um, at our elementary schools or our uh, secondary schools but certainly that I, I would like to see you know some kind of conversations continue I don't know how that's going to transpire well um, so I'm just gonna be very general here um, I was contacted last week by an individual I did share that information with the board um, I did have a conversation with uh, Jeff and Dr. Hiltz today um, about some of that information, if anybody reviewed um, that information. And because I, I had the same concerns when I'm looking at this policy and how much, how much discussion can we have now or how much is there that could potentially occur yeah. with the administration and we have a discussion at a later date. Um, yeah, I, I agree with so, you. I, I don't know if we're agendized to really talk about that, but it's kind well, of I related. Do think it falls within you know there. what I mean? Right. Yeah. Um, so I do think it falls within this policy, and I'm wondering, Dr. Hiltz, Jeff, the handout that I made and provided you, if I'm able to share that with the fellow board members. Oh, I think that would be fine, mm -hmm. wouldn't you? Okay, because yeah. I think it would address some of that, yeah. but um, it, it feels a bit premature. Yeah. And just to your, to your point, Mary, um, Amy and I have had a couple of conversations about the you know, food insecurity issues and the support offered by the district and a number of organizations. That's an ongoing conversation. Um, you know, certainly does not exclude the, the potential for a, a policy around it, but that is something that, um, you know, building staff have interest in, district level staff have interest in, Karen has interest in. Uh, and, 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 and like I said, um, it's, it's an ongoing effort, an ongoing discussion about how to best um, 
you know, build in those supports. And I know Amy has really strong connections with uh, a number of the, you know, the local organizations, the Hunger Coalition, the Blessings in a Backpack, and Peyton's Promise, and, and others. Um, and, uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, um, a, a lot of different organizations kind of working independently, um, which is, you know, has some benefits and some drawbacks. But I guess it, it, to, to sum up, there's, there's a lot of ongoing work in that area, but you know, obviously we're, um, uh, you know, doing what we can to, you know, support kids in their, in, in their needs. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe it's not so much uh, have it be a policy-driven initiative. Maybe it's it's an initiative, right? Or it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a goal, a dream, a, a vision, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, there are, uh, we can eradicate uh, food hunger or inse food insecurities. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that's something that we, we think about, you know, while we're doing strategic planning, right, mm -hmm. with you, Dr. Hiltz and the board, uh, because those little things matter so much. You know, so it, it just made me think about and reflect. Uh, mm -hmm. And I thought since we're here at PRL and we can talk about it, may as well raise it here and we can talk among uh, board members uh, and not try to say, Karen, you gotta take this and take off with it. It's more of engaging in a dialogue with all of you that it, I, I think it's something that's very valuable. Well, I appreciate that you brought that up, Mary. <laughs> um, because, you know, I for one think that there is opportunity to capture students that aren't being captured um, other ways and, and have accessibility and um, I think it just takes some more behind some more um, engagement <coughs> and meetings and learning um, who's out there and what, what can they do what, how can they assist I also think there's probably it's kind of like the iceberg thing where you see what's on the top but you don't see it what's underneath I think there's probably a lot of things, well, I know from working in a school, there are many, many things that happen behind the scenes that people want to um, protect the dignity and privacy of families, and so things get taken care of kind of on the down low and uh, without um, having a big program, needs are just met. I think that happens very often with our teaching staff and our principals that... Um, many many needs are just met and we might not always know about those but we have a very caring staff and employees in our buildings that, that care about the kids they teach and, and take care of the needs whether it's food needs for snacks or winter boots for their school forest camp out or whatever it is I, I see that stuff happening over and over again so um, while I agree with all of that I do think there's many many things that are happening that don't always get shared publicly. Yeah, we can we can certainly do both. Right? right? We can draw attention to the issue while protecting the, the people who need the help. And so I, uh, schools are not, uh, well, an ideal location, right, for, for this kind of thing because uh, the kids take that information home with them, the kids start uh, uh, including that within their idea of what normal behavior is, to be reaching out and helping other people, and at the same time, of course, on the receiving end, we don't need uh, to highlight the people being receive, receiving of it while we highlight the giving. Mm -hmm. so, so we can do both. We can also eliminate some stigma, too. If we're going to keep having conversations and say we need to protect these people, that don't, we, I mean, certainly maybe there are some individuals that would like to stay less known, but at the same time, if there's nothing wrong with needing a little help. And if, when we start eliminating some stigma, maybe there might be other people that would come forward and need a little help. I mean, just look at the, the government shutdown. Yeah. The, you know, it's like we're all one catastrophe away from who knows what. Um, so there's, there's nothing wrong with needing help. And um, I guess I... I, I That's can, a really good point, Tricia. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean... I look at how um, having five, now six snow days mm -hmm. has affected some support staff members who don't get paid when there's a snow day. Mm -hmm. You know, in the last two weeks, that's, you know, they're not making a lot of money to begin with. And so, yep, you're right. Okay, anything else? Yep. Then I seek a motion to recommend to the full Board of Education the approval of policy 
5900, Wellness um, and Nutrition as revised. Yeah, as revised today. And with, with, uh, with Trisha's. Trisha's remarks as well. They're, they're friendly amendments, I'd say. I would think so. They're not substantive. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll make that motion with Trisha's recommended changes. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. <coughs> and I would seek a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, abstentions? Motion carries. We are adjourned.